rule of thumb, never accept the first offer. You may not have anything to compare that first offer against, but just push, 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 and push, right? You keep persisting, like buying a house, you go through a, a multiple different counter offers to kind of come to an agreement or have, have a, at least an acceptable form of concessions by both parties. You have to treat negotiations with insurance companies almost the same way where you're patient with the process, uh, but also you know, bearing in mind that first offers that are sent to you are, are meant to be the lowest. This is Growth in Dentistry, a dental intelligence podcast where we ask the question, what does growth in dentistry look like to you? I'm Katie Polson, a dental hygienist and your host. Welcome to another episode of Growth in Dentistry. I'm Katie Polson, and we have another month and another theme. And although this, was, this one's not very sexy, but it does end in a really great goal for everyone, which is uh, for all dental professionals, which is getting paid. And we are discussing all things collection in, in the month of June and best practices of how to get paid better uh, to patient responsibilities and insurance portions. And joining us for that specific talk on insurance portions um, in our first conversation in June is Ben Tuane of Veritas Dental Resources. So Ben, welcome to the podcast. We're so grateful to have you. So happy to be on here, Katie. It's uh, been a long time coming that we finally are able to connect on your podcast. I've done so many other things with uh, Dental Intel in the past. But it's great to be with you here today. Yeah, and and I I didn't know he was like down the street from us people, so I think I could have had him in in the studio with us, but we'll do it next time. But we're we're he has for those of you that are able to watch it on a video, he has a really great background, better than we do. So he's he looks like he's on a beach somewhere, which is right where I'd want to be. So, <laughs> um, okay, so tell us a little bit about. Um, you yourself, uh, Veritas Dental Resources, and how it came to be? Yeah, so I sort of stumbled upon dentistry. It, it's kind of funny, my my story is uh, when I was a kid, I grew up in American Samoa, and back in the islands, it's universal health care. The government pays for everything healthcare-wise. So we had one dental clinic that had 60,000 patients. I mean, imagine that. That's kind of impressive. At one location, 60,000 people. And so everybody shows up for an eight o'clock appointment. So at 8 a.m., you have a couple hundred people that are in line to check in, right? And almost always, they don't call me back until 2, 3, or 4 p.m., my uncle being one of the dentists there. So he takes me back, and he starts to do a bunch of posterior compatible fillings. Basically, back then, they were just straight amalgam. Mm -hmm. um, and one time, he ran out of uh, lidocaine. Oh, no. I said, you know, we're not getting another shipment of lidocaine probably for the next four or five months, but you, we need to do this. Otherwise, we're going to have to pull your teeth out and do all kinds of other treatment. So he said, well, just buckle up, you know, had me um, hold. Uh, there are two really big guys that were holding me down and I was oh, my gosh. Yeah, be brave. But I think I was around nine or 10 years old and then started drilling. And I felt every <laughs> single angle I felt every single surface of that, that uh, drill. Um, and it was probably some of the most painful things that I've experienced in my life. Uh, and interestingly, thinking about dentistry back then for me was painful, right? And I never intended to get in the industry. Not, not that I didn't like dentistry. It's just never, it never uh, was on my mind. So I was invited by a friend in Arizona to come and run their entire insurance department. Coming, you know, me having no background in dentistry, pretty young guy, pretty successful in my form, previous career at that point. Um, I was asked to come in and negotiate fees. That was the first thing they said. We want you to run the insurance department, but we want you to negotiate our insurance reimbursements. So I started that in 2007, and that's sort of how I stumbled upon dentistry. I didn't intend to get into it. Um, when I started that activity, as a matter of fact, what I did is I put out advertisements. Do, do we still use career builders and monster.com? Are those still resume platforms that exist? They're around, <laughs> yeah. yeah. They're around. So that's where I went. I went to Craigslist. I put out advertisements and said, I'm looking for an office, a dental office manager that does fee negotiations with insurance. I got 300 responses and none of them had any experience negotiating <laughs> fees. 
So I start, and then I started putting out um, feelers and said, well, was there a company that can do this? And I couldn't find a single company that does this. Well, I learned how to do it fairly quickly. Within three months, I was getting these fee schedules back and the doctors were blown away. In fact, a lot of the doctors that worked at this group had their own private practices and they would get so upset and they'd come to our group and they get a thousand dollars on a crown mm. for the same insurance plan. They go back to their own group and they're only getting 500. So, so that kind of opened the door for me to look at a need, right? Couldn't find any company out there. So I just, I saw why well, I had this huge light bulb go off in my head thinking there's got to be an opportunity to create a business around this. So I did. That's awesome. 2009 yeah. and and here you are. <laughs> and here you are. That's ride. really great. I failed. I failed to. If you hear another man's voice, that's Adam Smith. <laughs> I'm sorry, people. For those of you that aren't watching, uh, he's back on the podcast with us, VP of Marketing. Um, and actually, Adam, you you um, had been coming and negotiate your fees in your practice that you owned. So that's yeah. really great. Um, so I honestly, as a hygienist of you know, almost 18 years now, I, I, I did not know real what, what a professional dental insurance fee negotiator was as, you know, just in a small practice. So I think we should start there for those people that are as ignorant as me. Like, what does that mean? What does that look like? Um, and why should it matter to a practice? Absolutely. You know, in, in the conference settings, the way I introduce, or at least answer that question is when people say, what is a professional dental fee negotiator? I answer it by doing the haka. You know, <laughs> if any of you know, <laughs> that's uh, good. If you if you Google haka, mm -hmm. you know, you'll find all different types of war dances around it. You know, Polynesian Polynesian version of a war dance, and essentially that's sort of what it is. It's you know, it's it's a personality type that sort of has this take no prisoners attitude when you're dealing with insurance companies, mind you. You know, as a negotiator, you, you win most battles and you don't win some, right? And that's okay. You know, any, any general, George Washington lost a lot of battles, right? And, uh, you know, you look at the history of um, uh, negotiations in any setting, you win some, you lose some, but a good negotiator will, will win most of them. So in dentistry, a PPO fee negotiator is, is somebody that will attack the insurance companies. And I, I say attack, not in a violent way. But you know what I mean, right? From the perspective of negotiations, like Katie, you mentioned that you've been a hygienist for a number of years. In this day and age, where the wages for hygiene have gone up, right? Mm -hmm. COVID sort of caused a reset with wages and a desire for people to get compensated a little bit more. But naturally, when you look at this whole thing called inflation and hygienists um, desiring to be paid a certain rate, in this case, 50 to 60 to 70, $70 an hour, when you're dealing with an insurance company and you're in network and you're only getting $50 for that high, that profi visit, as an example, naturally you see the numbers don't work, right? Yeah. So a good negotiator is somebody that looks at people like, you know, what you do, uh, Katie, the hygiene, the, the restorative work, crown and bridge work, implant work. You look at everything that is meaningful from a financial perspective for a dentist or a specialist. And you're going out to these insurance companies and you're getting the dentist what's necessary in terms of fees to pay for quality dentistry, right? To me, that's my $5 answer for a $1 question that you answered. So I'm sorry for being long-winded on that no. one. Oh, you're great. <laughs> no, I think it's really important for people to understand because uh, I think a lot of practices just get in contract and they just call it that and just take what it is. Because I think for, gosh, for a lot of practices, insurance is this necessary evil, this thorn in their side of that, and they, that's the way they treat it. And they don't really understand that they can negotiate their fees with insurance companies. Like it, it, they yep. can be negotiated. So it's important conversations. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so what are, I guess with those missed opportunities, um, what are some of the primary missed opportunities that you would see in a practice that um, I guess when it comes to negotiating fees with insurance companies, we go into a, a new practice, you yeah. know, what are, the, what are the first things that you kind of see? That's a great segue. Um, so one of the, the, the most obvious things that I see, and this is the vast majority of dental practices, is, is that they don't even try. Um, and it's not a it's not a lack of well it's not a fault on their own. Most practices don't know 
that you can negotiate fees with insurance companies. Um, but for those that do make an attempt, what I usually find as a big missed opportunity is the lack of follow-up or the lack of time, right? Again, nothing to fault the dental practices, practice owners, and those that work in dentistry. You wear so many different hats. No matter what role you play in the dental office, people are super busy to the extent where it's really hard to follow up on things um, that don't impact what's important in the, during the day, which is patient care, right? The treatment that you're delivering patients. Um, the other part that I see in terms of missed opportunities when people do actually get to that, that point of negotiating on their own is a lot of times the insurance companies will give a little, but they'll take more, right? And what I mean by that is yes, they'll increase your profi by 20%, but they're gonna take it away from your perial maintenance by 20%, right? Mm -hmm. That's probably a more obvious example, but typically what you see is they'll raise major procedures, crowns, bridges, implants, whatever you do on that major procedure category side of things, but they'll take away that increase and balance it out by deducting fees on diagnostics, right? Things that you do like 2000 exams, they'll maybe take a dollar or two off there, right? So, so the give and take as it, for, as it pertains to negotiations, when you get to that point, many offices fail to recognize that when an insurance company takes from a certain procedure code, th the insurance company is just balancing out what, what looks like an increase, right? Yeah. <laughs> They're taking yeah. it away. And most practices don't have the time or the resources. Thus, this is one great reason why we love Dental Intel is you can pull data in an effort to measure at least we know how to do that in a custom fashion in dental intel. It's not necessarily on the front end dashboard side of things, but we can pull data to be able to make sure that these increases or new fee schedules are actually safe to accept. And that's the biggest thing I'm seeing now is a lack of appropriate analysis on fee offers that come in to where you might think, oh yeah, great, it's a 6% increase. But when you compare it against utilization, it's a 0% revenue increase. 6% for the codes that they increase, but you're not going to make any more money from it. So that's a big misstep when it comes to negotiations that I'm often seeing. Yeah. Do you have anything to follow up with that? I feel like um, there's that. Just talk a little bit about just before we move on, if you've got another one, but I, I'm just thinking about the amount of time that that takes for you to do, to do like, <laughs> like, like, like when, when you say attack, you really have to be diligent. I mean, like I, gosh, I worked in the front as a receptionist and I verified insurance and I, oh my gosh, that's such a hard job just to even mm -hmm. get it verified. So I can't imagine the amount of time you spend on calls and phone calls with insurance companies and trying to get it all figured out. It's that's absolutely, a, that's, yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, it's, it is, it's one of those things where, you know, with practice management softwares, you have, you have the ability to pull reports, right? Right set reminders, you have software that helps manage your priorities, right? Um, when it comes to fee negotiations, you it's for most practices, they're, they're tracking things manually, right? Or by memory. And when you have a million things that you need to do in a dental practice on a weekly basis, you're naturally going to forget a lot of stuff if you don't have a means to follow up. But that is also a huge one where we've seen practices engage in the negotiating process where they would spend two years to try to negotiate. And because there was not a consistent uh, follow-up um, system, that's the reason why the, the, the whole negotiations was drawn out for that long, because mm. they just didn't have the right reminder systems put in place. And that's what, you know, that's where a person like us, uh, like me or somebody in this field becomes um, very helpful in the sense that you need somebody to keep on top of it for you. And that's almost... Well, that's one of the key ingredients is that persistence yeah. <laughs> is the key to this, right? Yeah, I would no. imagine they, they push it back and push it off and push it off until you become a thorn in their side and then they're willing to, then they're oh, willing yeah. to negotiate <laughs> with you. Yeah, I bet. So another yeah. benefit Ben, to, to someone like you is that a lot of offices, they, they don't know when there is give and take, right? They'll call and, and I, I've, I've had clients and friends that have done this and They'll have they'll put their their front office manager on the phone and say, hey, see if we can get better rates with these insurance companies. And they call and they say, hey, uh, we need to see if we can get our fee schedule higher with you guys. 
And the answer is no. <laughs> yeah, so yeah no. Make more money if the answer is no. And if they oh, don't yeah. know if there is give and take there, then they're like, oh, I guess the answer is no. And they come back to the doctor and say, no, they said no. So, right. Yeah, that's it. Brings up a good point because you know, in this this particular activity, let's say you do get a fee offer, and it's one percent. Well, how do you really know if that fee offer is acceptable, right? You have nothing to compare it against, and this is why you know the car sales industry is so successful, is that when you're dealing with people on a one-on-one -on -one basis, and that person is trying to negotiate with you, normally on the car, you know, the sales manager would make a little bit of an offer you know, to make it attractive, you know, give you a win, right? As a buyer. Typically in dentistry, those same techniques are used as well on the insurance side of things where they'll give you a little bit of a win. And the reason why is because even in the car, car industry, the vast majority of people accept the first offer. Um, and that's another big misstep is that you should, you know, rule of thumb, never accept the first offer. You may not have anything to compare that first offer against, but just push, 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 and push, right? <laughs> You keep persisting, like buying a house, you go through a, a multiple different counter offers to kind of come to an agreement or have, have a, at least an acceptable form of concessions by both parties. You have to treat negotiations with insurance companies almost the same way where you're patient with the process, uh, but also you know, bearing in mind that first offers that are sent to you are, are meant to be the lowest <laughs> initial offers. Mm -hmm. so. um, that's really great insight. Don't take the first offer. I like it. I need that. I'm always like, yes, yes, whatever. I just want to get this done. <laughs> um, Ladies, okay. don't accept the first proposal. Yeah. I was just yeah. kidding. <laughs> well, dang it. Okay. <laughs> just um, <laughs> so the, I, I would, when I was preparing for this podcast, I was thinking, I would imagine the size and location probably has a lot to do with the factor in, in the fee schedule, I guess that, or the amount that you can get. And I, and I didn't know, first of all, how do you use that to leverage better fees? And also, I don't know, I would imagine that there's some, I don't want to call it shady because we're really putting a bad light on insurance companies. So if you listen to this podcast and you work for an insurance company, I don't know why you would be, but that's really great. We're not trying to be rude, but like, <laughs> like tell us, talk to us a little bit about the size and like how that factors into size and location. Absolutely. So location, usually for practices that are in a, a part of town or a, a place where there are not many in-network providers with a particular insurance plan that has a presence, um, you have the upper hand. At that point, the insurance company would normally beg that practice to join or practices to join the network. And so when it comes to a limited number of in-network providers, and the best way to find out how many providers are in any given community, like Aetna, if you just Google Aetna dentist search, you can go in and do a search, put in, a, put in an address, look for a general dentist, five mile radius, and you'll find who's all in-network with that plan. You can do that with any dental plan. So as far as location, that's the biggest question is how many providers do they have compared to how many doctors practice in this community. Mm. And if that's a low number of in-network participation, at that point, if I'm in-network, I know that I'm coming with a position of power simply because if I choose to revoke my participation, it's gonna hurt the insurance company in a big way, right? Yeah. A lot of employers pick their dental plan based upon how many in-network providers are in that community. Mm -hmm. So typically what you see, and this is true, no matter where you go in the United States, the, the dental plan that has the strongest rate of in-network status among the doctors usually has the most employers that use that plan. So that's for location. In terms of the size of the group, um, it's true that if you have a larger group practice, whether it's a single location or multiple locations, um, the old rule of thumb was a practice that has 25 million in revenue or more would qualify for the insurance company's DSO department or group practice department. And sometimes the insurance companies would give you special accommodation. Now, I know a lot of people in dental intel travel, uh, like uh, Curtis and mm -hmm. a bunch of others, and I know many, <laughs> and they got that diamond medallion status or whatever airline <laughs> yeah. status, right? You know, you get free upgrades and you get them on, on almost every flight. 
So a lot of times when you have that volume, that size within a DSO, you get that similar, almost a similar type of treatment where the insurance companies sort of elevate you uh, to prioritize even claims reviews and things of that nature. Now, a lot of insurance carriers are trying to get away from that, right? Simply because when the, the solo practitioners find out that that exists, they call it discrimination, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? right? But when it comes to fees, absolutely group practices tend to have a little bit more leverage um, to negotiate fees. And that's simply because they have more providers to bring to the table to, to push in network, right? Now, that's not to say that solo practitioners don't have similar types of leverage. We see this all the time where a group practice or corporate practice would set up shop right next door to a client. Um, a lot of the client's patients would go to that practice, get treatment plans, and then they come back to that doctor, the original doctor, present the treatment plan. And on that treatment plan, it outlines all the in-network fees for that group practice. And now, you know, there, there's a law called the antitrust uh, regulations or laws that prohibit doctors, independent doctors from going to each other to collect fee data, right? And using that fee data to negotiate with insurance carriers, that's against the law. But when a patient brings that in from a group practice and you can see an outline of higher fees that the insurance company has contracted with that group, that's leveraged for you as a solo practitioner. And, and every solo practitioner I know that is practicing in the vicinity of a group practice, they do get those second opinion requests. So that's gonna be your number one piece of data as a solo practitioner is just wait for those second opinion requests to come in, match those fees, or at least compare them to where you, what you're getting from that same insurance plan. And almost always that is the only piece of data that you need mm. to go back to the insurance company and say, hey, you know why, again, discrimination, why? Why am I being discriminated against from a price perspective? Check out the, the, the federal government's price discrimination page, right? Read up on that to sort of understand how price discrimination works as it pertains to fees in dentistry. And what you'll find is that that one argument, it usually helps solo practitioners gain the same level of reimbursements that the insurance companies give DSOs. Hmm. So yeah, that's, size matters. That's, really that's super valuable. Yeah. That's, uh, I mean everyone's doing those second opinions, whether or not they're taking that data and feeding it back to their insurance companies saying, match this, otherwise you're discriminating. That's, that's super valuable for everyone that's listening. So thanks, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, I think so Pleasure. too. I mean, I can't tell you the amount of times where I've seen a patient bring in that paper, right? And then yeah. we don't do anything with it, <laughs> yeah. except for say, oh, it looks like they are, we probably should add one or more surface or something, you know, and then it leaves and that's where it ends, you know? Right. Yeah. That's super valuable. Really great. Well, Ben, we asked the same question to every person on this podcast, and that is what does growth in dentistry mean to you? Uh, Cause it means so many different things to different people. And we're, I'm excited to hear your response just because especially you've got a really bad childhood trauma that you still have to work through. <laughs> You know, I've received zero therapy for that <laughs> That's experience good. <laughs> and I, I, I don't regret it because I love dentistry, you know, being in this, in this field, in this industry, um, I sort of feel blessed to have stumbled into dentistry and, and in many ways, I, I, I kind of feel like more and more people should look into dentistry as a career or any aspect of medicine, including the business side, simply because there's so much growth opportunity, Right. I heard on another podcast that dentistry is far more advanced in terms of the focus on being both a clinician and an entrepreneur, more so than chiropractors, podiatrists, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, optometrists and other, other areas of medicine. So when I, when I think about this whole concept of growth in dentistry, I think as an industry as a whole, we're doing a great job. But we can do so much better, especially in this day and age, when you have inflation creeping up to 10% mm -hmm. and insurance reimbursements are trending in the opposite direction and going down 10%, right? Yeah. We see this every single day where Delta Dental or Aetna or Cigna today, Cigna sends fee cuts to doctors and they completely ignore the fact that life is getting more expensive for everybody, you know? So, so to me, growth in dentistry 
is looking at your relationships with insurance carriers from the perspective of, first and foremost, how do we structure a relationship that is gonna protect the financial integrity of care, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody in the practice gets compensated what they're worth. And you don't have to relinquish the, the, the premium labs or even the relationships with certain vendors that you, you enjoy having that, that contribute towards that mission of delivering the, the best care possible to your patients, right? I'm a big believer that when a business is, is set up to take care of its customers first, or in this case, we're taking care of the patients first. And that is the primary focus. Like Jeff Bezos said that in the beginning, he was obsessed with customer satisfaction, right? We'll look at where he's at today in terms of that whole mission where I'm an Amazon user and I, I use it every single day, something that's really bad to admit, <laughs> but I do it because the user face is easy, easy access to products, a lot of time savings, right? So many different things as a customer, I feel like they're working for me to make my life easier. So when we're dealing with insurance companies and looking at, at this whole question behind, you know, how can, um, or what does it mean to, to grow in dentistry or the growth in dentistry from the perspective of dealing with insurance carriers, quality of care is non-negotiable, mm. period. Yeah. You have to get paid what is necessary to sustain quality care. And whether that's negotiating in-network agreements, great or dropping insurance plans in a way that helps you protect the patients so that they can get the best quality care. You'll, you'll lose some, but getting the patients to understand and believe that quality over price is more important, right? Yeah. That's growth in dentistry from my perspective yeah. is, is achieving that goal and making sure that nobody pushes you around in terms of threatening the integrity of quality that you perform from a financial perspective. I can hear all of the providers just giving you a standing ovation. Because <laughs> <laughs> honestly, I know it's just as a provider, it gets so old just trying to think about what the insurance is going to cover. And that's all they're focused on, you know, and especially as a hygienist, you know, periodontal disease is so difficult to, to get people on board for sometimes. And it's just, yeah, I, I love that answer. Really, really great. Um, awesome. Well, I, I could go on for another hour, but we're not going to, because this is a short podcast. Um, this has been growth and dentistry, a dental intelligence podcast. Special thanks again to Benjamin too. And I have Veritas dental resources, Ben, if they want to reach you, where can they get you? Yes. Please check out our website, Veritas dental resources.com. Veritas is spelled with a V. Um, or you can give us a call 888-808 four, five, one, three, or if it's more convenient, send me an email, a uh, help at Veritas dental resources.com. Perfect. And I will make sure that those, uh, those, uh, links are also in our show notes and on our webpage. Thank you again for Adam for joining me. And thank you again to our marketing department for all of their work on this podcast. I'm Katie Polson. Keep growing.